welcome to managing your red team operations with Ghostwriter here at SoCon 2020. My name is Christopher Madalena. I'm managing consultant at SpectreOps and the creator and principal developer of Ghostwriter. While they won't be joining me for this presentation, uh, if you have joined us live in chat, you can find Andrew Childs and Daniel Heinsen hanging out. They are both major contributors to the Ghostwriter project and really deserve recognition because a lot of what we're going to talk about today wouldn't have been possible without them. So looking at our brief agenda, we have a lot to talk about, so I want to dive right in. What we're going to do is break things up into a couple of major sections. First, we'll cover some of the basics of Ghostwriter because I don't want to assume that everyone knows what Ghostwriter is, uh, and perhaps even if you do, you might have looked at it a year ago or more when we released it the very first time and haven't looked at it since. We'll talk a little bit about the back end of Ghostwriter and just what it is and what it can do. Uh, and then we'll move into that actual management of a red team operation using Ghostwriter, beginning with just looking at how to manage information, then how to manage your infrastructure, moving into activity logging, and then of course everyone's favorite part, generating some reports. At the end, we'll have a bit of time for some Q&A. When I'm asked to describe Ghostwriter, the first thing that has always comes to my mind is thinking about it as a additional team member, someone who is your dedicated note taker, who is there to manage all of your essential data, evidence files, just project metadata, who's going to be assigned to the project, what findings and observations have there been so far, all of that, it's there to help you collect all of it and keep it consistently organized from assessment to assessment, from team to team. It's a consistent team member that is there to really lubricate all the gears and other moving parts of your assessment. And of course, as it collects all this information, it has a pretty healthy reporting engine built into it that can do some pretty cool stuff that we're going to take a look at here in a bit. I'm very excited to announce that we have Ghostwriter version 2.0 coming out. And by coming out, I mean I released it today. So you can find it live on GitHub right now. Super excited this is finally out there. It's something we've been testing internally for a little while. We wanted to make sure this was a really good release before we put it out there public. And there's a ton to cover. Uh, so we just have no time whatsoever to get into all of it. So we do have a blog post and a pretty extensive change log on the code repository if you're interested in all the changes. Uh, but as we talk today, uh, I'm going to have this little guy here up here in the corner when I'm talking about something that is new to version 2.0 or has really changed in version 2.0. So you at least know, uh, you know that this is something new or something to be excited about. In some of those changes, we actually have updated a bit of the, the backend architecture. Uh, if you've looked at Ghostwriter before, this is a very familiar tech stack. Uh, you know, everything that we've used, you know, in version one of Ghostwriter and even before that, not much has changed. Uh, it's still a Django application, so everything's still written in Python, uh, Python 3.8 to be exact. We use a PostgreSQL backend for the database, as well as Redis for all of the uh, queue management for background processing, scheduled tasks, and the like. Uh, everything is dockerized to make it super simple to deploy. So with just a couple of commands, you can set up Ghostwriter on your laptop for local development or just playing around to check it out and destroy the containers when you're done if you don't want to continue using it or you want to move it to a server or anything like that. Uh, very easy to deploy. And of course, since it's all written in Django and Python, you can also just forego the Docker application altogether and stand it up like a regular Django application as well. Uh, not pictured here, when you do move it into production, uh, you need to set up a web server. And by default, the configuration we have for the Docker containers will set up an Nginx uh, web server as well for that to use. Uh, and you can use HTTPS and WebSockets to, to talk to Ghostwriter. And we'll get into actually a little bit more of that later on as to how those two protocols work with some of the new features. Diving in first to just how to manage information and actually distribute it to your team so everyone knows what's going on with a project. When you start a red team assessment, you end up with all kinds of documents. 
You have the statement of work, the rules of engagement, you have assessment objectives, you have various call notes from different people, from kickoff calls, maybe sales calls, maybe you've worked with a client in the past. So this is a continuation of some other assessment or you know, you need to know what happened last year uh, to really be able to understand what the client's looking for this year. All that information has to live somewhere. And unfortunately, the way that many of us, uh, you know, and so this is Spectre Apps included, you know, the way you distribute that information is, you know, you do your best to organize it all within some sort of folder on like a, a file share uh, or some other, you know, accessible location like a SharePoint or something like that. And you end up with this sort of like digital filing cabinet. And it's just not that easy to jump between documents uh, or reference other documents. You end up with, you know, little notes like see the statement of work for more information. You have to go and find it and open up yet another document. It's just not easy to know if you're looking at the latest information. What we believe, at least with Ghostwriter, uh, as we've been designing you know, some of the dashboards within Ghostwriter, and we'll take a look at one in a moment, is that your project information is really only valuable if it's readily accessible, it's always going to be consistently organized, and you have it in one location where everyone knows it's there, and that's where they find it. That's where they find the latest information. And even better if it can be linked and tagged. So you can actually reference something, you can click a link, or go somewhere else, you can see that data and hop right back and move between all that information and see it all without having to open up different programs or go to different locations to find you know, that information in some other spots, some other file share, some other document. The goal, how I think of it, is you're building a knowledge base versus that digital file and cabinet. You want something that is easily referenceable, but you can link to it, uh, literally like with a URL, like linking someone to Ghostwriter, uh, as well as being able to link different pieces of information together. It makes it a lot easier to understand just what you're looking at and know that you have the most up-to-date information. So one of the ways that we handle this within Ghostwriter is with a dashboard like this one. Uh, this is just a sample screenshot of the project dashboard. We've been doing some work on this for version 2.0. Uh, and we've moved over to a tabbed approach uh, from the old accordions, if you if you had seen that old UI. Uh, this one's a bit, a bit sleeker, a bit easier to navigate, and you can also see a lot more at a glance. Like, if you look over here at the screenshot, we can tell pretty quickly that this is a project that's going to run from November 16th to December 11th. We can see three people are assigned to it. There's three objectives. We can see that there's no findings yet, uh, but... We know when the assessment will be executing and we know who will be on it. We also know their roles and we have some notes that we can see on how their daily schedule might be impacting you know, their involvement in the testing uh, and the like. So all the information we might need as a stakeholder or someone just checking in on the, on the assessment right here in front of us. So let's jump over to a demo here real quick and actually just take a look at the UI and how you set up the initial workflow of getting an assessment started within Ghostwriter. When you first log in, you see this dashboard. This is something we plan to continue to build out. Uh, the idea here being that you get to see all of the most relevant information to you as soon as you log in. You can see your current projects as well as your current reporting tasks. We'll take a look at some of those here in a bit. But for this one, I want to show you what it's like to set up a new client and a new project, especially with the new interface changes we've, we've made. I've already gone ahead and created a new client. Let's take a look at Cable Town. Much like the project screenshot that you saw a moment ago, you can see here that when we take a look at Cable Town, we have this tabulated interface, each one grouping a different sort of type of information that we might want to see into one location so we can see everything at a glance. Here's all of our points of contact. We can see who they are, see their phone numbers, any notes about them. We can look at projects, the past and present future projects, as well as infrastructure history. So we can see all of the different servers and domain names that have been associated with some project for this client. This is all extremely useful stuff if someone comes to you and says, like, hey, do you know anything about this domain name? you know, in relation to a project of ours, has it ever been used with this client before? Or perhaps you've been told, hey, you're going to be working with Cable Town here soon on a penetration test or red team assessment. 
you might come here and check it out and say, all right, well, what what domains uh, have we used with Cabletown before? Are there any interesting things that I might glean from past infrastructure to mix things up this time around? When you're setting up a client now, we have also some very new forms, uh, which make things much, much easier. In this case, with the points of contact, we can very easily delete, edit, do a delete, or add a new contact with the click of a button all in line without having to resubmit multiple forms. Very, very handy, really streamlines this whole process. Let's take a look at a project. We'll go down here and look at this penetration test that's scheduled to be running right now. So again, at a glance, we can see who's assigned to this project. We can check out the objectives and their current statuses. We can also very easily put different statuses and apply them to the objectives. They take place immediately. We can look at the logs. We'll take a look at those a bit later, as well as the reports, infrastructure. All very easy to navigate and also link right to these. You can link to any of these tabs to be able to share this information and easily link back and forth. So before we continue, we'll take a look at more of this in a moment, but let's jump back to the slides for a few. Moving on to infrastructure, as you saw with some of those tabs, you can track things like domain names as well as servers within Ghostwriter. So let's take a look at why it's a good idea to do that and how Ghostwriter can help you do a better job with it. Managing infrastructure is a critical part of any assessment kind of seem like an obvious statement, but it's also something that is frequently forgotten about, especially when it comes to cloud assets. Those things that maybe only last an hour or two, if you don't log them right away, you might totally forget about them. We want to be consistent and precise when it comes to tracking our infrastructure. This is especially important when you're tracking things like domain names, because these things can actually affect other projects if they're not carefully tended to. For example, if you have a domain name used for one pen test that ends up getting burned because it was picked up by VirusTotal or some sort of scanner, uh, reported to something, whatever it might be, that domain might now be burned, or at the very least, you don't want to use it perhaps with that same client ever again. If that information is not readily available to someone who's then coming to look at using that domain, they might make the mistake of using that domain for the wrong thing and end up very disappointed with the results. You want to make sure all that data is being collected and logged. And doing that yourself can be very cumbersome. Having to do that by hand uh, or remembering to run a script isn't always going to work out. The Ghostwriter can help you out there. We track a number of things within Ghostwriter. One of the main things is the domain library. The domain library can keep track of some or all of your domains. It tracks everything from the creation date to the expiration date, whether or not it's auto and we need to auto renew, as well as so-called like health status, the categorization of that domain, whether or not it's been appearing on virus total, how often has it been used, how old is it? And the really cool thing is that your team can check out, much like they would check out a library book, check out a domain from the domain library, and then have that to be marked as theirs for the duration of their assessment. Everyone else on your team knows that domain is in use, who's using it, and what they're using it for. And then all that becomes part of the project history of that domain name. So it removes any question of, is this domain available? Did I ping someone in Slack to figure out if they can use it or not? All that is answered very quickly by having a consistent checkout mechanism like that that the team can reference. Likewise, if someone notices, oh, hey, yeah, this domain's been picked up by VirusTotal, or Ghostwriter discovers that, it can be marked as burned, uh, just to let everyone else know, hey, don't use this domain, it's dead. Likewise, you can track servers. Now, these might be servers that you own uh, in a data center uh, or something along those lines, uh, or servers that are up in the cloud. On a per-project basis, you can add things like your DigitalOcean droplets, your Amazon EC2 instances, your Azure computers. All of that can be tracked uh, within Ghostwriter so that everyone else can see on the team who's using it, and if there's ever any question that comes up of like, hey, whose IP is this? Client's asking about it. They can see what project it was a part of and who to contact about it. We've also been expanding support for things like cloud storage. 
all that stuff is things that you want to make sure you're cleaning up at the end of an assessment, like your S3 buckets. So soon we'll be able to more, more easily track all that within Ghostwriter as well. One of the ways Ghostwriter can help you out with this is with the new cloud monitoring task. Technically, this was in previous versions of Ghostwriter, but it's much more robust now and does a fair bit more. We hope to add Azure to this here soon, but currently it does DigitalOcean AWS. It uses those services APIs to collect all the data about your running assets, like your running EC2 instances, and then compares that information against known assets tied to projects. If it finds something that matches, that is part of a project that is now complete, it'll send you a notification by default. It'll use Slack, send you a nice Slack notification to let you know, hey, you have an asset off in the cloud that looks like it was part of a project that is now complete, and maybe that asset needs to be torn down. Likewise, if it finds an asset that it can't match up with any project, it'll let you know, hey, there might be something up here that is untracked and or potentially orphaned. You might want to figure out who owns it to determine if it should actually still be active or not. Let's take a look at how some of this comes together within the Ghostwriter UI. Here we are again at the infrastructure tab for that Cableton assessment. You can see here, we already have a fair amount of infrastructure being tracked for this assessment, but we probably need some more domains. Let's go look at what we have available in the domain library. One of the default views is just a list of all the domains. When you first visit it, it'll always be showing you only the available domains. You can easily turn that off and filter it or filter based on anything else and see all of your domains. In this case, we have a checked out domain. It's the one already attached to our project, as well as a reserved domain and all these other ones that are currently available. Let's look at the one that we already have reserved. We can see the project history. So this is our project. And as this domain is used, this will continue to grow. And you'll be able to see all the project history for that domain as it's used over the coming months or years, however long it's in service. You can also check out the health categorization. You can see the status of it. So in this case, it's unavailable since we're using it. And then we have the health and who is privacy uh, being two things that are tracked uh, pretty closely by Ghostwriter. Health is subjective. It's based on categorization. So if you click this button here to refresh categorization, it'll check virus total to see if that domain has been linked to anything like malware hits uh, or noted phishing campaign, uh, as well as pull in any categorization data virus total might have available. And then if Ghostwriter detects any of that categorization is linked to some of the bad categories that Ghostwriter tracks, which is primarily things like malware, phishing, suspicious, it'll mark that as burned to let you know, hey, you probably don't want to use this domain and you'll be able to see why. If you realize something has happened to a domain, you can come in and you can click mark as burned. You'll be asked to provide a reason and it'll then show up as burned back on this page. You can also check the DNS records. So we can click refresh DNS. That'll actually take just a moment. And we can see the current DNS records for this domain, which currently points to our GitBooks documentation. The next thing I want to show you is the update controls. That's how you can update a single domain, do a health check on just the one, DNS check on just the one. But if you come to this command panel, you can see everything else that's available to you, such as Namecheap Sync. So we support Namecheap by, by default. If you set up the Namecheap API and configure Ghostwriter to use it, you're able to pull in and actually sync with Namecheap. So it'll actually pull in all the latest data about your domains, pull in any new domains, and also update domains that have fallen off your Namecheap account because of expiration. A similar task could be set up for just about any registrar as long as they offer some sort of API. Domain categorization, you can run this for all domains with virus total by clicking this button, as well as do a mass update of DNS records. Uh, the DNS record task has been fully rewritten uh, for version two to use async DNS. So it is much, much faster and often finishes just about instantaneously, very fast. Very excited about that. Also, 
cloud infrastructure, as mentioned earlier. This is where you can kick off that cloud review. It'll go out and check all of your cloud services and come back with its report on all of its results. So that's just about everything I can show you here, but we have much more information detailed out for all the different tasks you can run and exactly like what vi you know, we look for in VirusTotal and so on in the documentation. So definitely check that out. For now, we'll go to the slides and come back here in a bit. Now to talk about something I'm very excited about, our support for WebSockets and automated activity logging. To lay the foundation for these next few slides, know that we've added support for WebSockets to version 2. Now that on its own, not very exciting, but it does let us do some fun stuff like opening up global messaging channels, both on a well, global scale, to every user logged into Ghostwriter, as well as personal channels to each individual user, so we can send you alerts that are most relevant to you, or let everyone on the platform know, you know, a task is completed, uh, or something has changed. Support for WebSockets also opened up our ability to start building out the REST API for Ghostwriter. And this is very, very exciting. Uh, we have only one REST API endpoint so far. That's the logging endpoint we'll talk about in a moment, but we have many more planned in the future. Currently, one of the ways we're using the WebSockets is with a functionality that I've just taken to calling the Overwatch functionality. So this is just a small feature that when you're taking different actions within the Ghostwriter UI, it leverages that historical data just to do some basic sanity checks. Uh, just to give you an extra set of eyes, so to speak, on your actions to make sure that you haven't missed anything. So for example, when you check out a domain name, it'll verify if that domain is set to auto renew uh, and whether or not it's going to expire soon. So if it's going to expire within the next two weeks and there's no auto renew and your project is four weeks long, it'll let you know with a little toast message just to say, hey, if you haven't noticed this, you might want to either renew it or make sure you pick a different domain name uh, before this expires. Likewise, it can do things like little OPSEC checks, like see if the project you've selected, look at that client and see if the domain has been used with that client before and let you know, hey, this domain might be, might be known to that client because it was used with this previous project. Maybe pick a different domain. And we'll be rolling out more of these Overwatch checks in the future, uh, wherever they make sense. These aren't things that will ever prevent you from proceeding or anything like that. They'll just be little toast notifications to let you know whether or not maybe you've overlooked something. But in a bigger way, one of the ways we're using WebSockets is with activity logging. So activity logging means different things to different people. Uh, it is, to us at least, far more than just tool logging. We at SpectreOps keep meticulous activity logs of everything we do. We want to capture more than just what might be spit out by a tool log. Also, we don't want to have to grep through a bunch of log files in order to find something. Uh, or try to sort through logs from different tools. We want our activity log to live in one split in one place to be shared by the whole team where everyone can see what's going on and be able to answer questions should they come up of, hey, was this you? We need to deconflict an alert, anything like that. But one of the most important aspects of it is we want to capture the human element. We want to capture that context know what your expected outcome was, what the actual outcome was, and whether or not you know you felt it was worth it. Why did you run that command? Is there any additional data you want to provide just to add some flavor or context that would explain why you ran that command? That's not something an automated log can give you. But what we can automate away is the timestamps, the marking down who you are, who ran that command, what tool it came from, all of that data, and make it so that the operator just has to fill in that contextual information. So Daniel Heinzen, as mentioned earlier, worked on our automated op logging, and he did an awesome job with this. It's now live and super, super cool. The way it works is we have our very first API endpoint, the logging endpoint, and essentially anything that can send a post request to an API endpoint can now send some logs to Ghostwriter. 
So we worked with Cody Thomas, the creator of Mythic C2, uh, to get that working. Uh, so now when you run a command in Mythic C2, you can configure it to with a script to also send those logs and the outputs to Ghostwriter for automatic logging. Uh, Daniel created a sample aggressor script for Cobalt Strike that does a similar thing, that every time you run a command, it sends it off with curl uh, off to the Ghostwriter server. Uh, but you can do this with your web browser. You can do it with a script. You can set up your own terminal to every time tmux logs something, it also fires off a curl request or something with like Python requests to log that as well. Once it hits the Ghostwriter server, it gets logged and shown in real time to anyone that is viewing that log page. The WebSockets were able to instantaneously update the logs and add that new row right there in the live view without having to refresh the page or you know refresh every five seconds, any, anything like that. It'll automatically update the page. This way, the entire team has a live updating view of everything else every command that everyone else is running. We also have support for CSV files. You can both import and export CSVs, uh, or for that import function, use the CSV file as an alternative method of actually keeping your logs. Uh, for example, you can use it as a backup. Uh, Daniel's aggressor script uses the CSV file as a backup in case it ever receives back anything other than the 201 created response that would let it know that the new log was successfully created on the server. It will then just assume, okay, well, I didn't get back a 201. It failed. Maybe my API key was bad. I couldn't reach the server, whatever it might be. And as a fallback, it logs that, that line to the CSV file. Then you can take anything that failed to log uh, or go completely offline. If your team server for Cobalt Strike, you know, can't talk to your Ghostwriter server, you can then, you know, at the end of the day or however often, take that CSV file and upload it to Ghostwriter as a alternative method of getting that over to the activity logs. The really, really cool stuff. I want to show you how it all works and how it's going to work in real time here. So let's hop over to Ghostwriter and take a look at the activity logging. Okay, revisiting that Cable Town assessment. Go back to that logs tab and take a look at the single op log that's already been set up. You can see there's no entries yet. Let's open it up, and sure enough, we have an empty table. Now, I've written a script that will just send some dummy data to the server, uh, mimicking the sort of information that would be sent from like Mythic or Cobalt Strike. You can actually find the script in the GitHub repo under the docs folder. There's an examples folder that has some example report templates and this example script. You want to try it out for yourself later. So. We can see here that indicator at the top shows that our WebSockets are connected. So the moment Ghostwriter receives any new data for this SOP log, it should update it for us automatically. So I'm going to send some now. And there it is. Instantly appears and updates for us. I'll send another one. And it'll keep updating and showing us the latest content. And you can see, of course, that the timestamp increments in exact seconds. So however many times I send this, the timestamp will always be whatever the current timestamp is and have all that dummy data that I've included. All that was about for me to do is come in here and edit the description or add any contextual details. So I can provide an update. And once I click off of that, that's saved and actually sent back to the server. Anyone who would also be viewing this activity log would see that line update in real time as well via WebSockets. This makes it super, super easy to automatically log activity from your tooling and then just leave this open in a web browser so you can come over and fill in any of that information as needed. If you're doing some manual work that you, know, you don't actually have a tool that can send that data automatically, you can, of course, always create a new entry. It'll fill in your timestamp and give you an ID number. And all of this has already been created. This is now in the server. You don't have to worry about saving it. You just have to go through and fill in this information. If you are doing something that's being repeated a lot, well, have no fear. You can click the copy button to make a copy of it and fill in or edit that information as needed for that you know, additional host you ran it against or whatever you did. If 
maybe you clicked on an accident, you can also click the delete button. Again, all this happens in real time and will update for everyone. So this makes it very easy for someone just to wants to monitor the activity logs or just see what's going on, is able to see what's happening with everyone across the whole team, whether or not they're actually working on the assessment or just you know, checking in to see how things are going. At any time, you can import entries uh, or export the entries. They'll be exported as CSV, either for just pulling off for archiving, uh, or if you need to export them and re-import them later, uh, all of that is possible via this new activity logging. So Daniel did some awesome work here. We're going to continue making it even better. Uh, but there it is for now. Let's jump back to the presentation and see what's next. Now for this last section, we have one of my favorite topics, the reporting engine. Begin with, take a moment to talk about building blocks of a good reporting process. The first is a template library. You want to build out a template for each type of report, each type of document that the team needs to generate. You're not trying to stitch together some sort of Frankenstein document from old documents and things like that. Have good solid templates that you can build upon, tweak, and keep refining. Same thing with a finding library. What our goal here is, much like with the report templates, is we build out a bunch of templates for findings. What you don't want to do is try to go back and find old findings and past reports and copy and paste them and reuse them or come up with new ones and keep reinventing the wheel each time you need to report on something. What that leads to is everyone reporting on a finding or observation a little bit differently and there's just really no consistency. Maintaining a library means that everyone can contribute to it, it slowly builds up over time, and everything remains consistent. Finally, the third one is a style guide. It might not be at top of your list if you're thinking of like, hey, how can I improve my reporting? But a style guide is extremely useful. If you've never built one before, uh, Bishop Fox actually offers a good basic cybersecurity style guide on their site to help you get a jump start. Uh, but this is a document that's meant to be a living document. It changes with you, and you can update it as much as you want. But the idea is that it's documentation for your team to use to answer all those little questions that might come up like, am I supposed to capitalize domain controller? Do I spell out DNS on the first use? Or is it common enough that I don't need to spell it out? Uh, all the way to what is the hex code of the proper shade of purple to use for my headings? It's extremely useful, maintaining consistency, and also without having to have people constantly bugging other people, hey, do you remember what this hex code is? Or do you remember what this rule about reporting is? So if you do those three things, you're in very good shape and down the right path to having a very good, consistent, and efficient reporting process. Ghostwriter can help you out with this in a few ways. First, of course, is the findings library. This has been in Ghostwriter since the beginning. You maintain a library of master findings. Any edits to these are global, meaning that anyone can edit them to fix a typo, add a better reference, anything like that. Very easy to edit all these findings. We have a WYSIWYG editor, so you're able to style and format the findings within your browser, and that finding styling carries over into the reports. And since you're just using a WYSIWYG editor, it's very familiar. You can hop in there, fix a typo, anything like that, and save it. Really removes all that friction that might otherwise be there if someone has to download a shared spreadsheet and update it, or open and you log into a wiki and make an edit there, much, much easier to be a ghostwriter to update these findings. Then when you're ready to add it to your report, Ghostwriter creates a copy, moves that to your report, and you can add that to your heart's content and it only affects your report. Once it's in the report, we have this brand new UI in V2. Whereas previously it used to be one big list with the severity of that finding, off to the left, we now have these nice groups, so everything's very easy to see what's in what category, and also now you can drag and drop to move things around. Not only can you position those findings within their severity groups, if you move a finding out of, say, high into medium, that finding's new severity will be medium. That updates on the back end, and 
now you will have two medium findings in this instance. It all happens seamlessly in the background via Ajax and JavaScript. You don't have to worry about going in and updating that finding. Also, the placement reflects how it'll look in the report. So if you want to tweak your report to have one finding above the other one, all you have to do is drag and drop, and that position will be saved, and it will appear in that order within your report. Also from this view, you can assign different findings to your teammates and see what the status is. Does that still have needed editing? Is it ready to go? All of that easily seen right from this one view. Also, you can see there's a little paperclip icon for attaching evidence. You can attach images as well as text evidence and other, other data to these findings and actually reference them inside of the findings where then Ghostwriter will dynamically insert that content, that image or that text content into your report at render time. We'll see that in action here in a moment. Just as a quick review of just what Ghostwriter is doing, on the left here, you have the WYSIWYG editor, which if you are familiar with Ghostwriter's WYSIWYG editor, you'll notice there's quite a few new additional options. All of that can now actually be used within Ghostwriter. You can do subscript, superscript, bold, italics, underlines. You can change the font color. Anything you might want to do, you can now do within Ghostwriter's WYSIWYG editor. Now, WYSIWYG editors, stands for what you see is what you get, saves everything as HTML. HTML, of course, does not look very good in a Word document, so we have to convert that. So what the reporting engine does is either converts it to JSON, that's one reporting option. So if you wanna take the raw JSON and run it through a script, take it into like another reporting tool, something like that, you're able to do that. Or the reporting engine within Ghostwriter will convert it to OpenXML for Office. And then you can output either an Excel spreadsheet, PowerPoint presentation, or a Word document. All of the classic Office documents that we're all familiar with are available. Then we have report templates. So this is new in version 2.0. We used templates in the past, but it used to be just the one. Just the one Word template and just the one PowerPoint template. That is not the case any longer. Now you can upload as many as you want, so you can make changes to each of those templates, have them for different purposes, different types of client requests, or just tweak them on the fly and upload one just for that one-time use. Whatever you want, you can now do that for both Word and PowerPoint. By maintaining your templates within Ghostwriter, you're gonna maintain consistency and you're able to share those improvements and quickly push out changes to everyone that's using Ghostwriter. So if you notice there's a small issue with something in your template, you can make that change, upload that new copy, and now everyone has access to it. They don't have to go try to find it in a file share, make sure they have the latest version. None of that. It's all immediate. Now, the other really cool thing we have for the templates is full support for Jinja 2. This particularly applies to the Word documents and unlocks the ability to fully template everything within the document using Jinja 2's expressions, filters, and statements. If you're familiar at all with Jinja 2, it's probably because you use it to build a web page. It works with HTML and other markup languages, which means it works with XML. So we're able to get it working with OpenXML for Office. If you've done any scripting or development work, this example here on the right side of the page but will look a little bit familiar. You can follow the flow. It's a basic for loop. This is the sort of language you can now put into the Word document to actually build out dynamic sections of your template. It can be a little bit confusing. It takes a little bit of getting used to. There are some very specific syntax rules you have to follow. And to help you with that, we've also built out a template linter. So now when you're building out your templates, you upload it to Ghostwriter, and it'll do a quick check for you to make sure that it actually renders, Ninja 2 can understand it, and also see if you have any unknown variables. So for example, here I uploaded a template that had these project end and project start variables in it. It recognized that it did not recognize those variables and spit out some warnings. A missing or misunderstood variable would not be the end of the world. The document would still render. So it's just a warning and I could use it, but it's just letting me know, hey, we don't know what these variables are. So I won't be confused when I render it 
report with it and see that my project end placeholder was not replaced. So I fixed that and re-uploaded it and it passed the linter checks, rendered successfully, and I got back my success status. So now let's see this in action. Let's take one last look at our penetration test here. We already have a report set up and we have some findings. As mentioned earlier, we have this new drag and drop interface where we can move anything around and change the severity as well as the position automatically. So for example, let's say we have terrible, horrible, no good, very bad vulnerability here and we think that should be a critical. Sounds like it should be a critical. So we can just drag and drop, move that up here. It's now a critical, no need to open it up and edit anything. That's all it took. And also the positioning has been saved, so it'll always be second following this one and at that critical severity. Next, let's hop into a finding and have a look at the WYSIWYG editor changes. So if you're familiar with the old WYSIWYG editor, you'll notice right away there's a lot of differences here, namely under the format tab. So we have all kinds of different formats like headings, inline styles like highlights, alignments, font size, font color, all this wasn't possible for. It's all brand new in version two and opens up a lot of really cool possibilities for the future, such as expanding how much of your report you can actually write within Ghostwriter. Another new feature in V2 that brings in yet more functionality for Word documents is this new reference tag. So when we first released Ghostwriter, you could do something like this guy here, which is referencing a evidence file attached to this finding called 30 rock. It's an image file. And this placeholder tells word to drop in that image file here as an inline image, and also include a caption below it with a working character field or, you know, like figure and number. Uh, so if you wanted to create a cross reference to that piece of evidence, such as say, as seen in figure X, and actually have that as a working bookmark and link that auto updates with that figure text below your image, you would have to do all that in Word after the fact. Well, kind of cool. We figured out a way to do that dynamically within the WYSIWYG editor and within the rendering engine uh, for Ghostwriter. So now all you have to do is take that same placeholder you're already using for your evidence and just add the ref tag in front of it with a space. Now Ghostwriter will treat that as a reference and create a real working bookmark in place of that when it renders the Word document. So in this case, we have some parentheses around it. So we'll end up with parentheses, figure, blah, that will actually work and point down to our 30 Rock image. Let's take a look at that in action. One of the first things that you'll do is you'll come down here and make sure you have your proper template selected. We're going to use the demo template. It's the one that I've created for this demonstration. Let's actually take a look at that right now. It's a pretty simple template, all things considered. Most of it is the very straightforward, just drop and replace variables used by Jinja2. So after Ghostwriter creates the open XML, it'll pass it over to the Jinja2 rendering engine. that will go through and do all these replacements. The really neat thing about this is that it really doesn't matter where you put the, the variables. You can put them in the header, you can put them in the footer. You can also style them, like these italis, uh, italicized ver variables will remain in italics when it's rendered. You can start to get a little bit more complicated with things like this, actually creating a table. Uh, it looks a little bit funny, but you'll see how it, how it plays out here in a moment. You can also get a little bit even more complicated with some interesting for loops and conditional statements. Like here, we're gonna use a filter that is special to Ghostwriter. It filters severity. We're gonna take critical and high and only return those for this list we're gonna create. The last thing I wanna highlight just real quick, we don't even have the time to get into it really. It's all well detailed in the documentation on ghostwriter.wiki, but are the new, these are the new rich text objects. So basically everything that was already available in the template before V2 now also has a rich text counterpart. 
These are signified by having underscore RT for rich text at the end and are placed in here using the R or P tags. Basically, this is whatever you had in the WYSIWYG editor is going to be dropped in here, fully styled, ready to go, exactly how you set it up in the WYSIWYG editor. Let's, let's check it out. So I already rendered that document for us. And here we are. This looks very familiar from what we just looked at, except now everything has been replaced by the Jinja 2 rendering. Here's our fully rendered tables. They look great. There's our filtered list of findings. And if we go down here, we can check out our evidence and our cross-reference. There's our image. It came in with the configured border that we had set up in Ghostwriter in the configuration panel. And here's our cross-reference. You'll notice it comes in as figure pound right now, but once you tell Word to update the fields, that'll become the, the proper number. And there's the working cross-reference. Pretty cool stuff. Lots of really powerful new tools for the reporting engine. Check out the documentation for more information. But for now, let's hop back to the slide deck and wrap things up. Before we close out, here's just a quick look at the top items we have in our development roadmap for the next several months. We're going to take a look at objective tracking as well as scope tracking. We want to improve the objective tracking and scope tracking has been a popular request for a while now. We have some really cool ideas for both of these. So we've been working on the planning phase of how we want to approach these and start to build them out. And we're getting close to having some final ideas and getting ready to actually start the development of these features. Uh, so look for some announcements on those in the near future especially as we get into, you know, past the holidays into very early next year. Uh, as we progress through next year, we hope to expand the REST API to allow additional like tool connectivity, uh, be able to pull data from Ghostwriter, as well as, and in particular, uh, one of our early goals for the REST API will be exposing endpoints for logging infrastructure. So that if you have any custom tooling or scripts that stand up cloud resources or, you know, cloud servers for you, those will also be able to send that information to Ghostwriter for automatic tracking of all of your cloud assets and servers and S3 buckets and so on. Uh, so that's one of the early ideas we have for the REST API, but we plan to continue to develop that until just about everything is available via the REST API. But that'll take a while and be much further into the future, but we have some very cool ideas here for uh, the very near term over the next several months. If after this session, you want to continue talking about Ghostwriter uh, or check in on it later on, and you're not already part of the Bloodhound Slack, please come and join us. Uh, we do have a Ghostwriter channel in there. There's also a reporting channel. They are generally unrelated, but I hang out in both of them. And there are generally some Ghostwriter conversation in both of them. There's also Andrew Childs and Daniel Heinsohn you can find around there, as well as many other SpectreOps folks. Also, if any of the team management or project management topics piqued your interest and you want to hear more about it uh, that's less focused on Ghostwriter. We did do a week of webinars. We called it back in April. Uh, and I gave a presentation that was much more focused on the foundational stuff, the more people-oriented topics of team management and project management, uh, especially from a remote context with the work from home or geographically spread out teams. Uh, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, you can check that out at getghostwriter.io slash RTPM presentation. Just a quick link that'll take you to the much longer presentation recording URL. You can check that out. That though, thanks for joining us. And again, if you want to get a hold of the code, you want to check out Ghostwriter, Get ghostwriter.io will get you to the GitHub page, which also then has links to the wiki and other resources. You can find me on Twitter, at cmadalina. Again, that Bloodhound channel, uh, hashtag ghostwriter in the Bloodhound Slack. Hope to see you there. And again, thanks for joining us. We'll move on and take some questions.